hello again. How do I wrap this up to say what I gotta say about the prototype Antichrist, who is pretty conclusively depicted as Justinian, as the prototype for what the Antichrist will be during the real tribulation that we won't be on earth to experience? Well, first of all, the issue was how to determine what was the anaphoric center in each one of these keywords that's highlighted in either blue or yellow are anaphora. They are deliberate constructions. We've kind of seen that now. And we know they're deliberate because the distance between each occurrence of each of these repeated terms is divisible by seven. And often, I, I want to say all the time, but I haven't tested them all, between this term and the next one, okay, but obviously here it's not going to be divisible by seven, but between here and definitely the next occurrence of whore, all right, between terion means beast and the next occurrence of it, and gunaika, which means woman, and the next occurrence of a similar word, which is gune. All the seeing words are also used precisely to depict deaths of emperors and successions. Okay, and you'll see that if you go into the notes. See each one of them, like see, I plotted them out. I showed where they seven, the distance is sevening in each case, and I got I gave you links to the people involved and the years, because you have to add 88 always to the syllable counts. And you can check this yourself. It's very deliberate. Okay, it's as deliberate as it gets. So what we've seen here is a very deliberate composition where the word distances are divisible by seven, not merely a very clever way to benchmark history, making it divisible by seven, with the meaning of the sevening is actually defined in the Old Testament, and it's consistently used with it to remind you of it, so it works as a kind of cross-reference concordance. In other words, what you're seeing here is a very carefully and deliberately constructed piece of writing based on syllable counts because the syllable counts function to tell you function to tell you what time these words apply to the words are a process of that time in addition to a general description with a fair amount of precision about what the beast in the physical tribulation we won't go through what it will be like because there will be people on earth who need to know what it will be like and by the time it happens they will have had all this history because this whole thing ends at 956 AD so they will have had that history because we're already a thousand years past it. So we can know very clearly what is the Antichrist pattern. So we can be forewarned and not be deceived and fall into it. Okay. Now what's really sad is that it should be obvious to you, even if you don't agree with the way I've interpreted it, and I'm not even so sure how much I agree with myself yet, I have to test it. But we can't disagree that this is deliberate. The numbers are the numbers. If this is always divisible by seven to its next occurrence, and this, and this always is covering somebody who dies who's an emperor and then the next one and why that why that period is selected is meaningful with relationship to the text we have to argue it was intended okay the way you might interpret this text for this time which in this case ends with the severance well that might be argued but 
you, it's hard to argue that it doesn't apply to severance since that's the syllable count. I mean, you don't have much room here. You have the, the avoid hiatus, you're going to have to say heptangalon. You can't say heptangalon, that makes you sound drunk. So it's not like I've used a lot of that. Fialas. You have to say that again for the same reason. Okay, that's that that doesn't give you much room. You got at most three syllables difference. If you were to take them out. But when you see how they fit the actual history, then you can see, well, okay, then that that's the pronunciation is must be right. Okay? Now, that's the first thing I want you to get out of this before I even get to the meaning of Justinian. Is that we looked for the anaphora, we plotted them out in order, and then you took the middle, which in this case has to be two of them because the middle is an even count of ten. The middle is, an e is, a count of, is in the middle of nine, and in the middle of nine. And these are the keywords. There might be other anaphora keywords that I'm not noticing, but these are the ones I've found so far. And so then where are the where do they center? Well they center here, here, and here. And this one's got terms are within verse eight. Alright. So this is kind of superfluous. At best you could say it might be a, a, a third outcome. Alright. So there is a precision. Somebody was paying attention to the syllable counts when this was done. And the next thing you know is that if they were paying that kind of attention, we have the words the writer wrote. Because the people copying this text for centuries, they didn't know this. If they had known it, they wouldn't have wanted Revelation 17 to be out because it's pretty condemnatory of Catholicism. But it's not solely condemnatory of Catholicism. It's condemnatory of religion dominating the state. It's condemnatory of the state dominating religion. And hello, we all kind of already know that. Because we've gone through thousands of years of history of religious wars to the point where we don't even want to talk about religion. Okay? That's the main reason for the U.S. being founded as separation of church and state. But that was also the way the Mosaic Law was founded. Moses was not a priest. Aaron was his brother. He was a priest. He was not a state ruler. He had no, none of the priests had a political function. None of them. Okay. Then in the middle, you had the Sanhedrin, which Moses appointed. And they were just judges to judge court cases. That was due to Jethro's father-in-law telling Moses, why, why are you trying to judge all these cases yourself? You know, Joe Blow stole my property. Judge Jane Doe had sex with my husband. Yeah, and then Moses has to sit in on all those courts, so they appointed the Sanhedrin. That was how it started. Separation of church and state. You have to be free to believe what you want, even if it's wrong. Okay? And so this plots out how that original idea that everybody in Israel knew it was already being abused at the time Christ was here. And this is how it gets abused under church. Because Israel falls because of the abuse. Israel falls because she doesn't believe in Christ. Israel falls and doesn't believe in Christ because she wanted a political king. And again, it's not political. Christ came as our Savior. To be a political king, He first have, you first want Him as Savior. And even then, there's a separation in the eternal state. Okay? See, the basic idea is that, is that you, shouldn't, you shouldn't impose belief on your subjects. That should be their freedom. The purpose of government is to ensure freedom. But it became a tool of gaining political power. That's why Israel went down. That's why church goes down. Okay? 
So what is the tracing of what ends up being the Antichrist? Because Christ himself said, truth will set you free. It was all about freedom. Okay? You believe in him as your savior. That's really separate from him ruling as a king. Even, even in the eternal state, it's going to be separate. So what happened? How did it go wrong? Okay, well, there's actually five chapters in the Bible that trace it out. And that will be in the next sub-series of Quantum Bible, showing you how all these passages interrelate. But right now, let's just look at this one. Okay, so, saying to me, okay, future end of the Kitos War. Why did they fight? Because the temple was down. They fought a political war and ended up being with Hadrian that lasted until, well, Trajan died in 117, starting 114, over their temple being down. They fought a political war over their temple being down. As a result of it, they were forbidden to even come into the land, except on Tishbaab, which is coming up this month. Some people like to say it's tomorrow. Today is the 8th. It's going to be the 9th. Maybe it's that. It's already the 9th down here. Okay. They will call this Tishbaab. It's really not the right date, but the Jewish calendar is all screwed up, so... All right, so first we have a war, a political war, over a religious issue. That's our first stop in what goes wrong. Because the angel's explaining, is going to explain the origin of the woman that he saw. Okay? So, I'm going to, let me show you. Come here and let me show you. All right? So what does he show him? Well, here's the first place where the whore name is used. Remember, it's all measured now. Sevening distance. So this is deliberate placement of these words where they are. In Greek, they could be placed in different order. The grammar would be the same. The meaning of the sentence would be the same, but the timing would not. And what is this word, what is this paired up with? Oh, the Bar Kokhba Rebellion. Because 44 years after 88 AD is when the Bar Kokhba Rebellion starts. And what was the Bar Kokhba Rebellion? A false messiah. It is the reason why they're going to be disallowed. Because see, this Bar Kokhba is an outflow of the Quito War. The Bar Kokhba Rebellion is going to be the cause of Jews not being able to even live in the city of Jerusalem anymore. They're going to completely raise it to the ground, call it Aeolia Capitolina, and a pig temple is going to sit where the holy temple used to be. So it's a religious war that they start with a false messiah. Seventy years after, the almost seventy years after the temple goes down. So what does the Bible call that? Whore. The great whore. Des Bornish. Des Megalish. Megalish. Yeah. Bar Kokhba is the great whore. That's your first great whore. Trying to unite church and state for the Jews. Totally misrepresenting the Old Testament. Now these, this isn't done by Christians. This is done by Jews. Who don't believe in Christ. This is the setup. Okay. Now, Christians were doing their own stupid things during the same time, but those aren't the events that are being picked here by John with his meter to these words. So he's giving you, as it were, the, the Old Testament. It's like the pronouncement. Why the Jews go bad? Because they united church and state. Because they, they, they forgot about God and got all involved in religion. That wasn't how Mosaic Law was set up. And to this day, they have that problem. To this day, that the what they call the law, which is, has no relationship to the law of Moses at all, they use it to, to beat each other up and tell themselves how holy they are. That wasn't the purpose of it. Okay? So that's the great whore outlined in black. 
All right, but it, but it's not like, well, did church learn the lesson from this? Oh, no. No, 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 no. The next time there's like the whore, he's sitting, she's sitting on the waters. Many waters means many peoples. Okay, which you later see in the text. Okay, and she does her little whoredoms with all the kingdoms of the world. That's got many meanings to it, so I'm not going to go through that. You know, it has to do with trade and everybody trying to profit off Israel and stuff because she was so rich. But our next time is like seeing the woman sitting. What is that covering? Oh, seeing the woman sitting. Well, guess what? The next group on the list that's depicted, depicted as the sort of flow of the development of the Antichrist, it first starts with the Jews. And, of course, you've got these interim comments in between. But I'm going just by the anaphoric keywords now. you got the severance. Well, the severance cult was exactly what is depicted here. A woman sitting. Yeah, they, the severance, severance basically pro, um, promulgated themselves as being a divine manifestation, okay? Depending on what kind of divine manifestation you needed to, to feel like you could support them, okay? The, the wife came from Syria. Her name was Julia Domna, and they all had this cult of the sun thing, which would end up becoming popular in Rome. That's how Severus comes to power, through mysticism. He himself was very superstitious. Married his wife based on her horoscope. Okay? So, do you understand? Kai, you know, short for Kaiser. We already saw that. Saw the woman sitting. Yeah, he wants to be sitting on Rome. So he perpetuates this myth. Okay? And the beast of red. Red is the color of religion. Okay? And God is clever enough. Oh, ah, yeah, we're going to have you die at that red word. Yeah, and Caracalla is going to murder your, your other son, Severus. That's what kind of red it is. You see, it's satirical from the beginning. But this is our first, like, the development of the Antichrist. All right, now this, this these are not Christians in the beginning. You're looking at Jews, and then you're looking at the Romans. Meanwhile, the Christians themselves are, are turning into little harlots during these very years. But I'm kind of skipping over that for right now. I just want you to see the flow of the text. So the woman is sitting on a red bee, scarlet clad, full of the names of blasphemies. Yeah, the biggest blasphemy is to unite church and state. Because you're supposed to be free to believe in God the way you want to. All right? And that's what Severus was doing. He was uniting church and state into a cult. And that's what the Severan mothers, Julia Domna and her, two, her sister and her, and her sister's kids, in order to keep power, they started using religion. Okay? Pagan. It's pagan. All right? And here we see the woman again. Still a whore, but he's, he's cut and see, he's got three syllables there, and it's three syllables with the definite article here, because he wants to make sure he's matching his syllable counts. And who's that? Well, that's Decius, still pagan. And what was that? Well, you had to believe in Rome's gods, or you would have your property confiscated, or other bad things were supposed to happen to you. They didn't enforce that much. They called it the libellus, and basically you had to pour a little goblet of wine on the ground, which was a way of sacrificing to their gods. If you did that, well, you'd go free. Didn't mean you had to believe in it. Okay, so they're, they're hypocritical as well. All right? But it's still a horror. Got to satisfy the horror. Got to pay the horror. You don't have to like her or believe in her or anything else. Just, you know, don't make me be graphic. You know what I'm talking about here. All right? So now, you've got the stage set. All right? The stage is set. That's Decius. So the next time you see the word whore, who is it talking about? 
Constantine. And specifically, it's talking about Constantine setting up new Rome. There's no doubt as to what is being meant here. Because all this is consistent in its meaning and it's not using Christians yet by the time the next occurrence of horror occurs. It's actually the second one. Second actual term. Pornace. But the synonyms were here and here. In context of known history that that's what they were trying to do is unite church and state. So for Constantine's founding of New Rome, the whole period of it. And that's before I even cover the other nasty words that are used for Constantine. Whore, New Rome, the whole town is identified as the whore. See, it was dedicated in 330. This ends at 332. Okay, this word is ton, por, non. Okay, well, por, non. It's two syllables. Okay, so at 3.30, because you always use the noun, is, is always has a definite article. At 3.30 is the beginning of what? The whore. You can't divorce the word tone from whore. The mother of fornications, literally. That's even worse. See, that's what this is. The mother of fornications. So Constantine's New Rome is considered to be the mother of fornications. That term was stronger than this one, or this one, or this one, or this one, or even up here with whore. You got that? The strongest, nastiest words don't begin until Constantine. And here's the killer. Musterion is a key word that Paul invented in Ephesians 3 for church. And, well, in Ephesians 1 9, I'm sorry, I forgot about that. In Paul, he was referring to the seven mothers. That's what was so funny about it, because Musterion means something hidden, and if you're pregnant, there's something hidden, you get that play. Okay, well, that was when the first religious council was held under Constantine. It's usually you can't find that too easily in the in the books. So there's a link to it. So you can read it up on the, on it yourself. That's at fourthcentury.com, which has all the imperial laws in it too. Okay. That was the end of 319. That's after Diocletian dies and before the final battle with Licinius. Because it was Constantine's Rome. Licinius was anti-religion. Anti Constantine cultivated it to, to keep his political power. Musterium, mystery. Bunch of doctrines known inside a group but not known outside it. That's literally what Musterium means. Okay, but he goes farther than that. Babylon the Great? And that covers the period when Constantine murders his brother-in-law, Licinius, and he murders his mother, I mean his, his wife and his and his son, and a whole bunch of other people, because that's when he finally defeats Licinius. But Licinius was his brother-in-law, and his own sister said, don't kill him, and he said, I won't kill him, and then he killed him. Babylon the Great, well, you know how Babylon is in the Old Testament. And, but the strongest term right here, mother of harlots, for the foundation of New Rome. So you see the path of the development of the Antichrist? We're first talking about where the horse sits. New Rome. In con what we call Istanbul today. It's not the one in Italy. It's been very clearly defined because of the meter you know where and what it is. This is the Rome that's called a whore. I'm not trying to say that Catholicism is right or good. I'm saying that the, the Antichrist, the, the identity of the Antichrist is a prototype that is very carefully defined and I'm showing you the path of the definition. Okay? 
and she's not only the mother of all the all the fornications, but she's the mother of all all the uh, abominations on the earth, and the very middle of abomination, right there, nah, is when Constantine dies. Well, you see how the other Bible passages depict his death. It's not pretty. But I just want you to see. See, it's getting real specific about where? New Rome. And who? Constantine. Constantine dies in the middle of abominations. Well, where does Constantine die? He dies in New Rome, which we call Constantinople and then Istanbul. That's not all Rome. That's not Italy. It's very specific. So the prototype of the Antichrist now has been fixed by the use of these vocabulary words very carefully placed so that you can be in no doubt we're talking about Constantinople. So whatever Constantinople stood for culturally is what the Antichrist is going to stand for culturally. Now, they might not call it Christianity. It doesn't matter what they call it. It's what it stood for. It probably will be called Christianity. And the reason why I say that is because he's using the word Mustadion on here. But to this day, there's this romantic notion of Constantinople being so rich. Okay? And it's Constantinople, not Italy. All right? And... Again, the terms keep on being used. You saw the whore drunk. Yeah. At this point, Constantine's sons are, have killed, are fighting each other. And they're drunk with the blood of all their subjects. Fighting over what? The definition of God. It's got one person or two persons. Is it one nature or two? Was he holy God at the moment he was born? Or did he sort of get credited and deified afterwards? Why, why should you fight blood against blood over that? Okay, I'm, I'm totally anti-Islam. I hate Islam with all my heart and soul. But I would never take up arms against it. Okay? Unless they came here and they tried to kill me. Or my country ordered me to go, but I'm too old. I wouldn't. Because you don't fight over belief like that. You might argue, but you don't fight like that because a person has the right to believe whatever he wants. And that was the rule in Moses' day. It is still the rule today. Oh, but if you're not ruled by the Bible, if you're not reading it and you don't care, you get religious. And that's what these kids were doing. Fighting each other over the definition of God, spilling blood and money and territory because they were politicizing religion. You getting this now? You see the flow? And of course now we're in our anaphoric center from verse 6 to verse 8. Okay? And that includes the beast terms because they're in verse 8, A, and B. Alright? And it first starts out with John saying, oh, he's amazed at the beast. And each again, each time this word to see is used, it's marking the death of an emperor and something to do with the successor. The same usage is in Mark 13, and the same usage, but less often, is in Matthew 4, 24. So these writers are counting their syllables, and they're aping the same style of using the seven distances for the same key words. That's how you know that they're key words, because they're doing it the same way, looking at the other guy's stuff. Okay? So then we have this litany of this history. With these keywords that basically shows you how everything goes wrong. It's hard to imagine it could get worse after the kids fighting with each other over the definition of God, but that doesn't stop. And here's this guy, Theodosius, and not only are they fighting over the definition of God, but they're getting more and more anti Semitic. They're more and more outlawing pagans or anybody who doesn't believe just like they do. And this guy here, Theodosius, who they misnamed the great. Yeah, he was great, all right. He was great at, 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 at hurting people. Because what does he do? He says, okay, I'm laying down the law. This My version of Christianity is the version of Christianity. Of course, that was way up here at Arles and the Nicene Creed and all that stuff, you see. 
And if you don't ascribe to that, well, then we can confiscate your property and kill you. So God killed him two years later. Well, two years after his younger son was born. This kid, this Honorius is 11 years old when he, his dad dies. His other son was Arcadius and he was only 17. And what that ends up meaning is that you can't very well enforce this law that Theodosius passed because the advisors are busy fighting with each other over who gets to control the kids. Good. And that means there's a little more freedom in the empire. God, of course, took Theodosius home and sort of made it hard for this our first well, maybe not our first. You have to call Constantine and his kids the first. This is our second Antichrist. You see how it's just a little bit above these? Because they didn't make it a law that you had to be Christian. And that if you weren't, you got your stuff confiscated. They didn't make that law. They, they practiced it on some occasions. They started doing it against the Jews first. But this guy, he made it a law. The Theodosian Code that everybody praises because it's a law and rule of law. No, it was a rule. To, it was a rule of of what do you want to call it? Tyranny. Okay. So fortunately, the kids were so young that that they didn't have a whole lot of time to enforce this nasty law that he passes and dies. Okay. So and you say and he, I was amazed at. Greatly amazed at the woman. Why? Because she was drunk with the blood of the saints. And saint just means believer. And with the blood of those giving testimony to Christ. Meaning they're more mature. They actually know some doctrine. Chaimatos means blood. And she's drunk with it. Yeah, the kingdom. Constantinople, Eastern Rome, and it still West includes Western Rome at this point until this guy who splits it. Drunk with persecuting Christians, persecuting Christians. You don't have this language earlier when you had the uh, Quito's War and, and the Bar Kokhba Rebellion, and even under Severus and Decius. And even Diocletian, who actually did persecute Christians. This nasty language doesn't actually appear. I mean, it's not pretty, you know. She's holding a golden cup in her hand that's filled with abominations. Okay, but the nastiest, most graphic language is reserved for Constantine and those who come afterwards. Okay? with a little bit of break every now and then in here. And and why are you amazed? Well, I'll tell you. Why are you amazed? I'll tell you. That's sort of a parenthetical statement. Yeah. During the parenthesis, Jerome manages to hightail it down to the Middle East and find some Hebrew scriptures and translates them along with the Greek scriptures he finds into Latin, which will be the best Latin that the West has for the next thousand years. Because by the sec the third century, well, second century, end of the second century A.D., they don't want the Greek anymore. They don't want the Hebrew anymore. They're anti-Semitic. Just give us the Latin. So they had the old Vulgate until Jerome came along. But God took care of that. So there's a little hiatus there between the tyrants. Okay. So why are you why are you amazed? Here, let me show you. That's a parenthetical statement. So we got parenthetical Jerome. And because of that parenthesis of Jerome, there was an actual Bible that was reliable. In spite of all this. Okay? So here we have Musterion a second time. I will tell you the mystery of the whore. Yeah, and Arcadius' death is a mystery. Okay, he dies in 408. They're not really sure how he died. Yeah, probably somebody killed him. And then ugly, disgusting, pulcheria means beautiful. Okay, so she's ugly. She's 14, and she's all full of herself and decides she's going to make herself a perpetual virgin so that she can fight against the priests and make herself more holy than them and have power, even over her little kid brother, Theodorus II. So now we have another Antichrist, this time in the form of a woman. 
And that's why the word woman is here. Ha ha, you get the wit. Okay, that's in the Eastern Empire. And she declares herself Mary de Altakas. So you're supposed, she's, she's, it's basically, and this is really weird how she does it. It's like, she's Mary incarnate, reborn, or something. And the whole Mary myth gets started up then. I mean, it, it had, like, ideas of this, this fake thing with the Mary Virgin thing. But she really carries it to a high level. They have to treat her like she's the Virgin Mary. Okay. So, whore. You get that? Is it too hard to understand? I don't think so. And the beast always stands for politics or political entity, really. And, and Honorius dies then. That's in the West. And it's a beast, all right, because it killed Stilicho, who basically saved Rome. Okay? And so this is the beast that carries her. Yeah, it's carrying her in the East. Because when this guy dies in the West... There's this hiatus as a result. With one set of advisors fighting another set of advisors. It's a long story. Okay? So you see, these are nastier words used for primarily the Eastern Empire, but at this point, the West still exists. Okay? The beast carrying her, the religion. Okay? So we're getting little bits of, of additional advance on the concept of what Antichrist is. It's the horror of religion, riding on politics, in other words, using politics to advance itself. And therefore, dominating so that you're not free to believe whatever you want. That your beliefs, if, if anybody finds out, can put you in jail, confiscate your property, make you lose your life or limb. Okay? And having the seven heads and the ten horns. Now we went through that. Those are confederates, advisors. It doesn't necessarily mean separate nations. I went through that in prior videos. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that. Okay. Well, here's who they were. Because I those that's the Ephesians tie to it. And in that section you're going to find external links to the history of that time. So as you can see what's meant by seven heads and ten horns, which we're going to see again, but it's in a different context when we see it again. Okay? And here's the beast that you saw. Okay, what's the beast that you saw? Oh, Council of Chalcedon this time. Where one group of Christians says, our definition of God is better than your definition of God. And it should be the official definition of God. And anything other than our definition of God, well, your property should be confiscated. And you should lose your life. And your property should be confiscated. And you should lose your wife. And your property should be confiscated. And basically, your property should be confiscated. This was a get-rich-quick scheme, so if I didn't like you or you didn't like me, I'd go to the local priest and I'd accuse you of not being a Chalcedonian. And then your property would be confiscated and I'd win it. Or you'd do the same to me. How Christian is that? Not at all. So you see, Antichrist now gets another addition, another facet to its definition, which is the people as a tool of greed. Okay, the beast that you saw was, yeah, that's how it was. Okay, and then I went through all the, the purple, which is the, the satire of this text. Okay, and then our last, what do you want to call it, the last effective ruler of Rome in the West, was Valentinian the third and he's not anymore by the end of that phrase. He doesn't exist anymore. So now we're getting into specific persons with a specific syllable by syllable accounting of how are they contributing as it were to what's going to eventually be the Antichrist that succeeds. Okay? And I went through all this history already because we're still, this is the anaphoric center from 6, 7, and 8. 
and what clinches it is when you get down here, that's the end of the first 490. So you're now learning something else about the rise of the Antichrist. What are you learning? You're learning that it's a recurrent pattern that occurs at the end of a 490. Okay? The development of the Antichrist takes approximately 490 years from Christ's birth in this case, 490 years from Christ's death in this case, and then it characterizes the 70-year voting window in between. Okay? So every 490 years, this is going to be a pattern of history to look at because this is the first one. And, of course, you, the other Bible passages tell us that, that it goes on, all right, plus when you look at the actual history that's covered. But you see the point? That's another aspect of the development of the Antichrist. Satan doesn't know when the rapture is going to happen. And it takes him about 490 years in the last, basically, 120 of the 490 years. He manages to create something enough of a horror that he thinks he can maybe take over and make church so apostate, God has to say, okay, you're going to have a rapture, all right, but it's a rapture because you're so bad. You can't lose your salvation, but you can lose your maturation. So if enough of us go negative to God en masse, it'll be just like the flood. That's the idea, okay? So then we got into the specifics of who these people were. And... Even at the time of Anastasius and Anthemius and Leo, even though they were trying to enforce the Council of Chalcedon, they wanted to be loosey-goosey about it because half of their people didn't agree to it. And they didn't want to enforce political will over a religious idea. So even though the laws were on the books, these rulers were noble because they didn't want to really totally enforce this. Okay? They wanted to be loosey-goosey about it. And, you know, it's basically, yeah, these are laws on the books, but if you don't believe with them, we're not going to do anything about it. That was like the way Trajan was in writing to Pliny. It was basically, don't ask, don't tell. If you make a real stink of yourself as a Christian, well, then maybe we have to send you to the lions, but we'd rather not. Just, you know... Practice your faith quietly without disturbing the empire, and you'll be okay. So that's what they were doing. And it worked. Because, you know, half of them didn't agree with the Council of Chalcedon. Until we get to Justin. And he wants to enforce the Council of Chalcedon. And he wants to get all kinds of money as a result of doing that. And especially his protege, his nephew... Because this is right where both come to power, Justinian. And as we've seen, Justinian is the culmination of the poster boy who wants to, yes, enforce Council of Chalcedon, but not according to what it says, which is bad enough, but according to what he says. And he's God by 553. The whore is him. Now, then he has his, Constantinople almost falls at Hupo, which is 557, 558, and this is 559, 560, 561. He's sitting there. He's the whore who's sitting, because he's God now. He dictates to both the West, the bishop in the West, which we call Pope today, but they weren't called Popes then. He dictates to the bishop in the West and all of them in the East what church doctrine or anything about it is. It's all subject to his approval. So who's the whore now? Personified. And who's it personified in? Justinian. And so what does God have to do in reply? There's the whore. He's now sitting. Okay, but in order to free the people so that they're not stuck with that, 565, both he and his general die that year. And Rome, even in the East, will never 
B as big again. It started to be at, as far away as Spain and as far away as just below the Caucasus Mountains in the east and far south as you want to name. And within, oh, I don't know, a year or two after he died, all oh, that's broken up. So what's the character of the Antichrist? Well, we saw what led up to it from a cultural standpoint. And now we're seeing from a personal standpoint, this is a guy who, oh, I'm building a holy church. Este ho, de ho, este ho, de ho. I'm building the church of St. Sophia. And God is making fun of him doing that because he's putting Sophia in the same clause. At the end of 544, his St. Sophia doesn't mean nothing. He just wasted money on it seven years prior. Because it's going to go down right here in 558. And he rebuilds it, of course. Because he's not learning the lesson. So what is it about the Antichrist? First thing, he thinks he's doing God's work. That makes him feel good about himself. And when bad stuff happens, he knuckles down. And that all started right here. That's how, that's how he lives and dies. He, he's like Trump. He gets harder and harder. He thinks he's doing God's work. And be, every success he has tells him that he's doing God's work. Every failure he has, it, he tells himself, well, I'm doing God's work and that's, things are bad because I'm on the right track. In other words, the Antichrist to come, and it could be tomorrow, the Antichrist to come is going to be diluted like this guy outlined in black. Okay? That's exactly it. He basically rules from here, well, at the middle of Le Ponton, all the way to here. Now, imagine being that person. You die. Because he was like 82 or something when he died. And you spent your whole life telling yourself you were doing God's work. And on the day you die, you get your report card from God. We know that from 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. Paul knew his report card before he died. And God says, uh, you, you didn't do so good. We saw what happened with the report card on Constantine. Middle of abominations. Most of the report cards we've seen so far... Archai, you thought you were a Kaiser? Well, you're just a mere connection point in history. You're just a mere conjunction. Our poor boy, though, who told himself how much he was doing, is basically depicted as the whore sitting, well, not quite anymore upon them. So he's not even a good whore. That's the epilogue. Unfortunately, Humankind isn't learning from this either, and we're going through it again right now between Trump and Russia, because they think they're they're producing the next Justinian. So, a live portrayal of what he went through and what life was like then is getting ready to happen again. Does that mean the tribulation is going to occur? It's going to feel like it, but I doubt that it's going to be the actual official one. We'll see. Peace out.